Good evening, dear friends, and welcome once again to Exodus. Let us implore God's blessing and spirit as we begin the class. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O the loving Father, as we have gathered this evening once again to listen to your word, let your word empower us, let your word direct us, let your word heal us. Send your spirit upon each one of us, that we may be open to the prompting of the spirit. Let us pray together. I will meet with the Israelites there, and it shall be sanctified by my glory. I will consecrate. Of meeting and the altar, Aaron also and his sons I will consecrate to serve me as priests. I will dwell among the Israelites, and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Almighty Father, you are our creator and our redeemer, and you care for our, you care for us extends far beyond our understanding and our reach. Give us the humility to accept that ultimately, and we do not know all things, and although we may explore our world and develop it, we can never compete with your supreme creative and saving power. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us ask the assistance of our Blessed Mother to guide us. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without an Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I ask for the Shabu to begin the class. Hello, dear friends. Good evening, good afternoon, and good morning. So we come to another day of class during this uh, Holy Week. As I mentioned yesterday, we have uh, anticipated today the class which we generally do it on a Saturday. And this week is... Uh, very special for all of us Christians. Um, and on Saturday, uh, we would be preparing for uh, the Easter uh, Vigil service. So uh, we will uh, uh, take today what we would have been doing it on Saturday. And uh, I hope to complete the next uh, 10 chapters, that is uh, chapter 30 to 40 in the coming week, two days that we have in the coming week. So I intend to uh, cover up to chapter 30 today. Um, and so you have the uh, uh, PPT also. Uh, and so we will be able to move uh, faster. And uh, if we have some uh, issues between, you can stop me and um, we can clarify. Because uh, these uh, chapters uh, will speak about uh, uh, 
mostly about the vestments, the ordination of uh, the priest, uh, the materials associated with the worship, etc. So we don't need to go into a lot of uh, details because uh, several of these were written after the, uh, the real uh, construction of the temple in Jerusalem. And many of these are modeled on the temple in the Jerusalem. Okay. Um, with this, I will uh, share the screen. So, brother, could you allow me to share the screen? Yeah. Incidentally, this is the very same text that uh, Brother Samuel took for uh, our introductory prayer. Uh, because I, I would repeat this because uh, this is the core of uh, today's uh, class, the, the most important message that uh, we will be dealing uh, That is taken from chapter 29. I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar, Aaron also and his sons, I will consecrate to serve me as priest. I will dwell among the people of Israel and will be their God. I repeat, I will dwell among the people of Israel and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. Look once again uh, at this text. You see a very important vocabulary repeated. I will dwell among the people of Israel. Again, towards the end that I might dwell among them. Okay, keeping this in mind, we proceed to the uh, text of the, uh, of the Bible. Okay, we move to chapter 26, the sanctuary um, of the, uh, of the uh, tabernacle, the sanctuary. Uh, chapter 25, we saw uh, different uh, elements yesterday. The ark, the table, and the lampstand. That's how we concluded yesterday. Menorah, the five, four, seven forked uh, uh, lampstand, which is the symbol even today of uh, Judaism and Jewish worship. So we move to chapter 26. The pattern of the tabernacle and the sanctuary. This account blends the ancient tradition of the tent of meeting, which is in the chapter 33, 7 to 11, and the later view of the structure and adornments of Solomon's temple. Uh, in 1 Kings chapter 6, when Solomon Builds the temple and uh, consecrates. And later, Ezekiel speaking about the uh, temple in chapter 40 and 243. There is a pattern, pattern of the detail in uh, Exodus and that of 1 Kings chapter 6 and that of Ezekiel. So it is called the tabernacle of the tent of uh, meeting. 
tabernacle of the tent of meeting because this is the meeting place between god and his people the items that we mentioned yesterday you know, the ark the table the menorah they are now to be housed in the structure mandated in the sanctuary that's why chapter 26 is going to speak about the sanctuary you know from the second millennium site of mary to modern bedouin culture you know, the large tents have been used for sacred purposes so there is a, a cultic value very much attached to these large tents right from let's say 2000 bc the sanctuary that is mentioned in chapter 26 is a portable uh, tent of the size of the temple of solomon the place for uh, the divine presence from the time of the hebrew exodus through the conquering of the land of uh, canaan or canaan so this sanctuary is the place of divine presence and this sanctuary had its importance right from the time of the exodus from sinai till they conquered the land of canaan of course it will continue even till the construction of the temple by solomon the elements that are mentioned were made part of the final temple in jerusalem so it was the same pattern um, there would be even the similarity in the measurements the english word tabernacle the english word tabernacle is derived from the latin word tabernaculum meaning tent tent uh, the tabernaculum is itself a diminutive of the word taberna meaning hut or booth or tavern uh, we find uh, different uh, measurements uh, for the sanctuary as stipulated in the book of exodus first the wooden frames form a rectangular building that is uh, approximately 45 feet long 15 feet wide and 15 feet high that is the structure and it is open on the east secondly seeds of finely woven materials are sewn together to make two large sheets and sheets are joined together by means of loops and clasps and have the cherubim embroidered on them thirdly seats woven of goat hair are stretched like a tent over the sanctuary fourthly ram skins dyed red cover the whole building there are two veils first veil is the veil over the entrance to the sanctuary verses 36 to 37 and the second veil is more costly as you read from the detail uh, this second veil splits the interior space between the outer area is called the holy place and an area in the back the holy of holies 
So there are two ways. One, at the entrance to the sanctuary leading to the holy place. And secondly, the separation between the holy place and the holy of holies, the most sacred place. Behind the veil in the holy of holies, what we call the most sacred area. Uh, so stand the ark and the propitiatory, the so-called mercy seat that we mentioned yesterday. Uh, this area, the so-called uh, the holy place and the holy of holies, especially the holy of holies, um, is reserved to Yahweh, Yahweh's own place. That is why it is called a sanctuary. In the holy place are the menorah and the table of the showbread. Yesterday we spoke about the showbread, the table of the showbread. The uh, two sets of showbread, no? the six loaves each on either side. From the tabernacle, the, uh, we can next we turn to the uh, surrounding uh, sacred area. The central object in the court was the altar of burnt offering where the main sacrificial services uh, took place. So central part of the court is the altar of burnt offering. So uh, you have uh, a depiction of the uh, sanctuary. Okay. So this, uh, see, this is the, and if you can see the cursor, the first, um, Um, the veil, or the main entrance, sorry, entrance. This is the so-called holy place, and in the middle of this area, we have uh, the uh, altar of uh, sacrifice, altar of sacrifice, about which I will uh, speak a little later. Uh, this. Or uh, this, uh, the the so-called tent. Okay, this is of uh, rectangular size, rectangular shape. Um, the um, the tabernacle, the tabernacle, which is also called the tent of uh, meeting. So there is uh, uh, one um, wheel here. And inside there is the most holy or the holy of holies, the holy of holies. Uh, inside the holy and the holy of holies. Okay. There are two uh, screens, uh, two veils. Okay, another uh, uh, view of uh, this uh, sanctuary. The altar. No, the altar and the place for uh, washing uh, the uh, uh, the tabernacle in okay, the sanctuary. They are all um, um, tied to the pole. Uh, here you see the tens of the people are around this uh, sacred place. So people pitch their tent um, around uh, this sanctuary. So God lives in the midst of the people of Israel as we read in the uh, introduction. Okay, we in chapter 27, uh, we move to the altar and the court. Uh, 
uh, verses 1 to 8 will speak about the altars and main difference between the altar in chapter 28 of 27 of uh, Exodus or other par other uh, places in the in the Old Testament and the altars in the churches today Christian churches is that um, the altars are placed within the uh, churches inside the churches but the ancient Israel the altar was located outside the temple building in a courtyard area accessible to the people okay the people here okay altar of sacrifice no, this is the altar of sacrifice so and here people can come and the goats and uh, bullocks no? they are uh, sacrificed here uh, so this coat or courtyard is uh, accessible to all the people and uh, what is this uh, altar made of? It is basically a hollow wooden box about seven and a half feet long, seven and a half feet wide, and four and a half feet high. That is the uh, shape, the measurement, the structure of the altar. It is uh, plated with the bronze on top now you might wonder this is made of a hollow wooden box plated with bronze but difficult to understand how it is operated because the heat from the whole burnt offerings destroy the altar made of a wooden box uh, this is uh, 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 an issue. Suggestion is given by certain people. They are stones placed on top of the altar for burning. That is a suggestion uh, to protect the wooden altar from uh, getting burned. You see, the stones are placed on top of the altar, and then the burned offerings are offered. Now, the four corners of the altar are provided with horns. This is of great importance. Horns on the four corners of the altar. What is the purpose or significance of the horn? The, an offering for God would be brought to the altar and bound to its horns, according to Psalm 118, verse 27. Now, more important, more theological is that the horns were grasped by persons seeking asylum at the sanctuary. As you read in uh, First Kings chapter one and one fifty, there are there are few exceptions because these horns are visible sign of uh, Yahweh's uh, protection. So even if uh, you run away from your enemy, uh, even uh, in a way a criminal, running away and holding on to the horn of the altar then he has the protection from Yahweh or any deity for that matter ancient times so if someone holding on to the horn of the altar and an enemy pursuing and killing the one who is holding on to this altar that person who kills the one holding on to the altar is made culpable he has to pay for this for this but maybe by his own uh, his own life 
but there are exceptions okay as you find in the first kings chapter 2 28 there is an exception if you read in the story of solomon okay there is an exception otherwise the holding on to the horn is a sure guarantee of protection According to Psalm 75, horn is the symbol of strength. So this is a, a picture of a, 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 a horned altar. This is from uh, the south of Israel, from the sanctuary of Beersheba. Sanctuary of Beersheba in the south of Israel. The four horned uh, altar. See, the these horn um, are used for either people to hold on to, or people came and uh, tied the offerings to these uh, horns, and that was uh, they offered to God the sacrifices. Okay, so this is uh, you have an idea of uh, the horned altars which uh, even in the uh, sanctuary of Shilova where recently archaeological um, excavations uh, um, unearthed the old uh, altar with these uh, uh, horned altars okay. um, verse um, uh, 20, chapter 27, verse 9 to 19. Give um, us an elaborate uh, courtyard for the desert sanctuary. The courtyard, detail of the desert uh, sanctuary. Uh, it is uh, 150 feet long. 75 feet wide, seven and a half feet high, as you read from verse 18. A barrier of bronze columns and silver curtain rods that hold uh, linen curtains sets off the coat from uh, all other areas. There is a barrier of bronze columns and silver curtain rods. Uh, remember, the vision that Ezekiel had, where he pictured the temple surrounded by a wall to separate the sacred from the profane. So the Yahweh God, who is a holy God, he lives okay in the midst of people, but there is a separation from the sacred to the profane. Uh, now, the oil for the lambs is 20 to 21. A pure oil which is extracted by pounding the olives in a mortar rather than grinding um, and pass through a strainer. That's why it is called uh, a clear oil. So, no sediments of the um, extract is found. So it is uh, stained and it's uh, clear. It is pure, made of uh, olives, you know, olives pounded and not drowned. Uh, the pure oil is to come for uh, the service of the temple from the people. People have to eat, but they, once they bring, to the temple, it has to be handled only by the priest. Then we have the sanctuary light. What is the purpose of the sanctuary light? It is intended to be a perpetual reminder of uh, the presence of Yahweh in the desert uh, sanctuary. The sanctuary light will always be lit. And the sanctuary light is lit with a pure olive oil. 
and today in the christian churches you know the sanctuary lamb especially the catholic uh, churches the sanctuary lamb is uh, uh, lit 24 hours a day to recall the presence of god in the temple in the church okay once the electricity um, operated uh, the lights okay different uh, types of uh, uh, sanctuary lights lamps are in vogue in use okay we go to chapter 28 um, with regard to the priestly vestments uh, chapter 28 there are uh, basically seven uh, vestments that are of importance mentioned uh, there i will um, pick out uh, some of the most uh, um, vestments that are uh, used uh in the also later in the uh, salomonic temple temple built by solomon see um, some knowledge of the history of uh, uh, priesthood will be very very important and imperative to understand uh, this part of uh, the text see priesthood proper appeared in the judaism only at a later time not at the very beginning of uh, the call of abraham for example no patriarchal period they were not priests they themselves were uh, like a family priest and even even at the passover time in uh, exodus chapter 12 no reference to priests so the father the, the head of the family acted as the so called priest so there was a priesthood uh, at the very early uh, jewish uh, era so that is of a uh, later origin so with the rise of uh, monarchy we come across uh, two phenomena one especially after the death of solomon in 922 the monarchy was divided into two with the northern um, monarchy northern kingdom with its capital in uh, samaria went in for several sanctuaries against the traditional temple at jerusalem there was uh, also monetary value attached to the these sanctuaries the uh, jeroboam first the first king of the northern kingdom wanted to discourage his people going down to jerusalem for uh, the celebrations first the temple also involved money so 10 tribes that are in uh, northern kingdom would be going down so also it would have just got its uh, economic ramifications so what did uh, jeroboam first to do he erected different sanctuaries in the uh, place bethel in uh, dan samaria and so on so there were uh, rival sanctuaries um opposed to the one sanctuary in jerusalem um the two that's the first phenomenon okay the rival sanctuaries so instead of one in the south there are several sanctuaries in the north second phenomenon is uh, increased centralization of the jerusalem temple the once the temple was uh, constructed um there was uh, a lot of uh, 
emphasis given to the centralization of cult and under uh, Josia, King Josia, um, and at the time of the Deuteronomy, they, uh, Josia initiated a reform by, uh, um, you know, destroying um, several uh, uh, sanctuaries. So the policy of uh, Deuteronomy was the policy of one God, Yahweh God, one sanctuary, that is a sanctuary in Jerusalem, and one worship, the worship in Jerusalem. That was the policy of Deuteronomy. One God, one sanctuary, one worship. So this, as a result of this policy, Greece serving in the country shrines were put out of work. We have the reference to that in Deuteronomy 12. Um, so many of these priests were descendants of uh, Levi. Now once the country shrines were uh, destroyed, discouraged, and the priests were left without a job, these Levites became second class citizens. So Deuteronomy had to provide for the upkeep of uh, even these Levites. So together with the biblical triad of uh, widows, orphan and foreigner, Levites also were put part of the charity of the people of uh, Israel. They also had to be supported as, uh, let's say, second class citizens because they had no work, um, they were unemployed. In Deuteronomy 26 12, when you have finished paying all the tithe of your produce in the third year, which is the year of tithing, giving it to the Levite, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. So that they may eat within your towns and be filled. See the pathetic situation of the Levites once they were left without job. So they had to be uh, put together the category of the disenfranchised, the sojourner, the fatherless, and the widow. Okay. Uh, the only legitimate priests were uh, the Zadokites of Jerusalem. And who are the Zadokites? They descended, those descended from uh, Zadok. And Zadok, you see from First Kings, was the, the priest appointed by uh, Solomon. Were not strictly descendants of uh, Levi. So throughout uh, the history of Israel, you will find this struggle between the Zadokite priesthood and the Levitical priesthood. It, continue, it began with um, Solomon appointing the um, descendant of uh, Zadok as the high priest. So from Solomon's time, all the high priests were uh, Zadokite priests. And they claim their lineage from Eliazar, first to Chronicles. Okay, Eliazar is the third son of uh, um, Aaron. Uh, from the uh, book of uh, Leviticus, we will know that the first uh, two sons of uh, um, Aaron were uh, um, uh, killed, they died. Um, Nadab and Abihu, Aaron's son, instead um, the descendants would go, uh, the Tadokite um, priest uh, claimed the lineage from uh, the third son of um, Aaron, Elias. So at the time of uh, Jesus, only the Tadokite priest exercised a high priestly role in Jerusalem. Uh, um, you hear of uh, Sadducees, 
the Gospels. So Sadducees were the descendants of uh, Zadok. And they were the, uh, the so-called aristocratic priesthood, the priestly class. And the high priests were always chosen from these um, uh, Sadducees. Okay? So the struggle was there um, right from the beginning. And even at the time of uh, Jesus, till the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem. Okay, we go to the, now. We go to the Levites. The Levites now became synonymous with the inferior cultic employees who were subordinate to the sons of Zadok. We have that in from Ezekiel chapter 44. So originally, um, we have uh, seen uh, some promise made to Levi that his descendants would be serving the temple. Yes, they would be serving the temple, but the high priest would always be from the Zadokite priesthood. Levites would serve in the temple as, uh, let's say, in our term, like uh, uh, sacristians and uh, cleaning the um, the inside of the temple and uh, all the precincts and all that. So it is uh, they were they serve in the temple, but not as the high priests. So P writer, priestly writer, um, tells us that Aaron's family was the preeminent uh, priestly line, and that is why we have the ordination of uh, Aaron in the Exodus and much more solemnly done in the book of Leviticus. Um, from Genesis 49, the numbers we know that early in the Israelite history, the tribe of Levi became a priestly class. Um, but now, only Aaron will be given all the vestments of the priest because he is the high priest, Aaron. And other priests are given other vestments, not all the vestments that are proper uh, for uh, Aaron. And the children of Aaron are only, in inverted commas, assistants, uh, co priest or assisting priest. The high priest would be Aaron, so all the vestments are reserved to him. The book of Exodus gives importance to seven types of uh, priestly dress for uh, the priest. Okay, I will uh, uh, quickly mention a few of them. First, effort, or uh, in American English, you might call effort, or effort, chapter 28, 6 to 14. What is this uh, effort? The effort harks back to the early cultic practice at the central sanctuary of Shilova. So even today, if you go to the ancient sanctuary of Shilova, there is a museum. Um, because many of the artifacts taken from the archaeological excavations are displayed there. And they have reconstructed uh, the, um, the dress of the priest and effort is there, so taken from the central sanctuary of Shilova. So this is, um, a ford is a linen apron worn by a priest and used in connection with the sacred lot or dyes. Uh, generally two of them. Um, they will be known as uh, uh, Urim and uh, Tumim. Urim and uh, Tumim. I will read out to you from words uh, 30. In the breast piece of judgment, you shall put the Urim and the Tumim, and they shall be on Aaron's heart when he goes in before the Lord. Thus, Aaron shall bear the judgment of the Israelites on his heart before the Lord continually. 
So uh, this is a kind of a, an apron. So apron is tied to the heart, the front part of uh, the priest. Um, and this is a, a, a linen apron. And the two dies for the sacred lot of Urim and Tumim are put in the bag inside. The engraved stones on each shoulder piece symbolize the priest intercessory function on behalf of the 12 tribes. So on either side of the shoulder, a piece is attached. And on either side, both sides, the names of uh, the 12 tribes are uh, engraved. So each shoulder, each shoulder um, symbolizes the intercessory function of uh, Aaron. Okay, this is a, um, a graphic of uh, the garments of the high priest. Uh, this is the apron type of uh, afford. Uh, there is uh, the blue robe about which I will speak later. At the end of uh, the blue robe, the tasseled fringe with the uh, bells. Uh, this is the breast piece, the 12 names of the tribes are uh, uh, placed with the precious stones, with the um, Reuben, his name will be here first, and then all the names, 12 sons, 12 tribes, the names of 12 tribes are inscribed. Um, okay, on the either side, you know, there are these stones, precious stones, with the names of uh, 12 to represent uh, the 12 tribes. The headdress, the headdress, and the golden frontlet. Okay, I will mention some of this in the coming minutes. Okay, so this is the... Um, um, the apron, the afford, afford, or above the blue uh, robe, these fringes here, and uh, the breast piece tied to this uh, afford. Okay, so you have an idea of the uh, priestly dress. So the second one is the breast piece of decision. What is this breast piece of decision? Hanging from the shoulder pieces was the breast, breast place of judgment. A pouch or a bag containing the sacred lords known as Urim and Tumim. Okay, so this is the a uh, breast uh, piece you know, hanging to the shoulder and inside inside which is uh, close to the heart of uh, Aaron uh, a bag inside where uh, they will place the Urim and uh, Tumim the sacred lot okay they are known as the uh, Urim and uh, Tumim um, what how do they function uh, these lots provide, yes or no, see inside um, they keep these dies, the sacred lot. Um, and uh, people ask uh, for oracles. You know? They want God to discern. They go to the priest. What does the Lord ask of me? As you read from uh, 1 Samuel. Uh, chapter 14. You know, it's very interesting. Uh, they, First uh, Samuel, uh, chapter 14, um, 36. It is uh, the case of uh, Saul. 
he wants uh, an oracle from yahweh he wants a response to the question so he is in a dilemma so he is asking god whether you should fight against the philistines so um but the priest said let us draw near to god here verse 37 so Saul inquired of god shall i go down after the philistines will you give them into the hand of israel but the answer did not come he did not answer him that day so the priest will put the hand in the pouch or bag to discern the answer so uh, depending on the uh, dice that uh, the priest gets the answer would be yes or uh, no so if you continue reading you know Saul is uh, asking so um, asking god and he wants uh, uh, the answer look at verse 42 and he says then Saul said cast the lot between me and my son Jonathan and Jonathan was taken so this um, is uh, casting um, the lot and the answer would be either yes or uh, no uh, this is the, the breast piece in, inside which there is the pouch or a bag and the dice will be inside so here is uh, okay there uh, they have put the name of the tribes okay there is a uh, ruben no? and uh, simeon levi so it goes on like dan so all the uh, 12 tribes are uh, uh, presented kept uh, to the heart of the uh, priest who should be praying for the 12 tribes of israel the intercessory role of the priest and the third is the blue robe of the effort uh, the blue robe is a, a garment a short garment the blue robe of the effort was born was born under the effort so over the blue robe the priest would wear the effort and there are bells in, at the fringes the bells were once thought to protect the priest from the demonic attack so when the priest enters the sanctuary the bell rings when he comes out automatically the bells ring um, if you look at verse 35, it says, The bells ring so that he may not die when he enters the holy place. So, ancient times, maybe they may have attached to some magical powers to this ringing of bell. But for the Bible, the bells remind the priest that they are in the holy place. I think even in the, the Catholic liturgy, at the time of consecration in some of the churches, even today, ancient times, it was followed very uh, meticulously at the raising of the consecrate, consecrated bread and wine, the helpers would ring the bell. No? That is a, a special time, a privileged time, a sacred time. The bells remind the priests that they are in the holy place. And the bells signify that the priests seek permission from the Lord to enter and come out of the holy place. So before they enter the holy place, bell rings. So it is taken automatically. The Lord is allowing them to enter. The Lord is giving them permission to enter and come out. Okay, this is the, the blue uh, robe with its uh, the fringes, with the bells. Um, so high priest um, uh, wears this the golden bells and pomegranates 
were attached to the hem here. Bells, a picture of listening to God while in his service. Pomegranates, a picture of fruitfulness. The sound of the bell were the assurance that the high priest is serving before the Lord. Okay, these are some of the um, meanings behind this uh, uh, blue robe and the fringes with the pomegranates. The fourth one is the headpiece. The headpiece, a rosette of uh, pure gold fastened to the turban, symbolizes the regal splendor of the priest. Again, we find also in Ezekiel chapter 21. And on this um, turban, on the rosette of pure gold, there is an engraving, holy to the Lord. It reminds the people of Israel that they are God's own people. They are holy people bound by a very special relationship. So this uh, turban, uh, the rosette, um, and uh, written there, holy to the Lord. Made of uh, gold. It cover the turban and the plate tied to it. Uh, the priestly, okay, chapter 29, we go to chapter 29. Um, 29 is the investiture, the service for the ordination of the priest. So it uh, uh, includes three things. One is the purification, other is the clothing, and third is the anointing. Purification, clothing, and anointing. Uh, more detail of uh, this investiture ceremony um, is carried out in uh, chapter 8 of uh, Leviticus. All of uh, Leviticus 8 is regarding the ordination of uh, Aaron. The anointing of the high priest follows the ancient rite of anointing the king's head with oil. See, um, a mess messiah, the word messiah, comes from the word mashach, you know, oil. Meaning, messiah, messiah, messiah means anointed. That's in Hebrew. In Greek, it will be Christos. Right, Christos, anointed. In anointed with the oil. So because one is anointed with the Mashiach oil, he is Messiah, Mashiach, no Messiah. Uh, the, this, this was the ancient right of anointing the king's head with the oil. Uh, and this was the right used also for the anointing of the high priest. Um, so this anointing makes either the priest or the prophet or the king the Lord's anointed. So anointing is technically by God. So priests, prophets and kings, they're anointed for God. So the priestly tradition traces the line of the high priesthood from Aaron to whom the priestly office belongs by perpetual ordinance. So, since Aaron is the first priest, high priest, now in a perpetuity, this priesthood is given to Aaronite priest, the descendants of Aaron to perpetual ordinance. The second part of chapter 29, there are different sacrifices connected with the priestly consecration, which shall see them quickly. 
there are three different types of sacrifices involved in the consecration of the priest one is the sin offering that is sacrifice in the bullock it is meant for the this offering is for the sins of the priest since this is made for a remission of sins the part of the bullock or the victim is not shared is completely given to god because this is meant for the remission of our sins sins of the priest secondly holocaust burnt offering of the first ram there are two rams the first ram is burnt verses 15 to 18 and the third one is the communion sacrifice that is uh, um, killing or sacrificing on the second ram and that is um, shared shared among the participants this is called the communion service communion sacrifice is shared between the participant the priest and the participants Uh, Moses uh, consecrates the priest by rubbing the animal's blood on the extremities of the body of Aaron and his sons. So that is how the ordination rite, the consecrated rite, is exercised by rubbing the animal's blood on the extremities, touching the blood upon the ears, hands. and feet to represent the entire person the whole person is consecrated for the office so this is a total offering the priest is going to be a full timer full timer for the pre for the service of the people of god full timer Okay. that is the uh, symbol of uh, touching the blood upon the ears and hands and the feet or the extremities of the body uh, moses putting parts of the victims in the hands of the priests signified that they were authorized to receive the portions of the offerings yes so priest will be fed by the offerings except the uh, sin offering and maybe some strictly uh, in the book of uh, leviticus chapter 1 to 7 chapter 1 to 7 you find all the details of the sacrifices so except the sin and guilt offering the communion uh, and the free will good will Uh, sacrifices they are all um, you know um, given to the priest and the priest is fed from the portions of the offering okay uh, there is um, a technical term that is used i would like to mention that in chapter 26 sorry 29 verse 26 to 28 called the elevation offerings what is this elevation offerings it refers to the act of moving the sacrifice toward and away from the altar to symbolize presenting the gift to god and receiving it back as a portion this called the elevation offering so if to go, bring it to the altar and take it away the priest uh, will take the portion from the people give to god as a sign and they also partake from that that is by taking it away from the altar so the priest who have a share in many of the portions offered for sacrifice uh, verses 35 to 37 will indicate that this ordination is a seven day ceremony the long ceremony of 7 days uh 
uh, owing to the efficacy of the blood the sin offering is for atonement i have uh, highlighted that word atonement because it has the meaning of covering covering the yom kippur day of atonement the day of atonement kippur means covering so it covers the sin and sanctifies the priest so the sin offering is to cover the sins of the priest and to make him holy sanctified uh, no, that that's not yet over okay first is the atonement for the sins of the priest then the sin offering also makes atonement for the altar to cleanse and consecrate it with blood so the altar is also cleansed uh, in a deeper sense atonement actualizes divine forgiveness and reconciliation uh, end of uh, chapter 29 takes us to the daily sacrifices um, if you uh, read through this um, you will come across the daily burnt offering of uh, two yearly uh, lambs this is what you shall offer on the altar two lambs a year old regularly each day one lamb in the morning and the other in the evening 365 days so uh, uh, except on the yom kippur day it's a different type of uh, uh, offering um then all the other details are there from verse 20, uh, 38 onwards no one tenth of a measure or uh, one tenth of uh, an ifa ifa is a uh, uh, jewish uh, measurement all the details you can read so what i want to highlight is that there is a daily offering daily of the priest uh, i mentioned a few minutes ago the priest is consecrated his entire person is consecrated so it is the responsibility of the priest to offer sacrifice for the people the consecration of the altar the sanctuary and the priest look to god's ongoing presence in the midst of israel that's how the chapter uh, uh, concludes this is what i read at the beginning of uh, our class as the theme for uh, today's class so the consecration of the altar the sanctuary and the priest look to god's ongoing presence in the midst of uh, israel um if you read uh, verse 44 uh, i will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar aaron also and his sons i will consecrate you know, consecrate means to make sacred uh, so aaron's son also will be consecrated to serve me as priest and i will dwell among the israelites and i will be their god so you see the technical formula of the covenant you shall be my people and i will be your god and i live in the midst of my people i dwell it is a highly theological term highly theological term well it is in that tent you know shekinah 
Tekira is the Hebrew word, the place of God's residence. And I dwell. And you see, Saint John, the evangelist, takes the mystery of this theological word. The word became flesh and dwelt among us. That took his abode or pitched his tent. That's literally. Word became flesh and pitched his tent among us. That is what we call the incarnation. And this theology is so deep and profound here yeah, at the end of chapter 29. I will dwell among the Israelites. So God lives in the midst of his people and God has his residence in the midst of his people. Why? Verse 46. They shall know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of the land. Now see, this God, look at the slide, this God who dwells among them is none other than Yahweh who brought the Israelites out of Egypt. So Israel's cultic institutions are thus in the Exodus and Sinai. So later, all the festivals, yearly festival of uh, Passover or the uh, Feast of the Booths or the weekly celebration of uh, Shabbat or daily prayers, they all go back to this twin experience of the Exodus and the Sinai covenant. So Israel's cultic institutions are thus rooted in the Exodus and Sinai. The liberation movement that is set in Exodus climaxes in the worship of Yahweh. No liberation movement without worshipping Yahweh, giving credit to God, acknowledging the work of God that has brought about the liberation of Israel. Okay, chapter 30. Um, the other priestly matters. Um, chapter uh, 31 to 10 um, it speaks about the offering of uh, incense the incense too was a very ancient uh, cultic practice we know from uh, isaiah chapter 1 uh, most probably taken from the canaanites you know, all the ancient uh, cultures had this um, for various uh, purpose. In the secular court, the public place, where people from all walks of life arrive, they used to burn this uh, perfumed incense to drive away any foul smell. In the uh, temples, you know, um, this had a, a theological meaning. As the um, smoke goes up, the prayers of the people reach up to heaven. So incense symbolized the prayers of the faithful going up. So the priest had to do it. So each morning and each evening, the priest removes a piece of coal with a shovel from the altar of Holocaust, sprinkles powder on the coals and places them on the altar of incense. Um, if you read Luke 
one, chapter one, eight, nine. Uh, this is the context to the statement in the chapter one. It's about uh, um, that is about uh, Zachariah, Zachariah, who was uh, serving the priest. It was his duty. So he was, Zechariah was chosen by Lot according to the custom of the priesthood to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and uh, offer uh, incense. The so offering of incense each morning and each evening was part of the duty of the priest. Okay. Then verses uh, uh, 34 to 38, end of this chapter. Provide the mixture for this absolutely sacred perfume. Uh, if you go through the text from verse 34 onwards, the formula for the incense as in the uh, holy oil was actually a priestly secret. This is not divulged to lay people. A secret kept only among the priests. The mixing of uh, the proper mixing of uh, the perfumes. Um, for example, there is a uh, stacked uh, stack tea, or sometimes in English, stack tea, S T A C T E. Uh, it is uh, uh, mixed with, it is actually an oil of uh, myrrh. Um, I'm reading uh, from uh, verse 34. Okay. Take um, uh, sweet spices, uh, stack tea, stack tea in uh, Greek. It's a, an oil of uh, myrrh or uh, uh, onika. Onika. This is a, a, a spice from uh, a mollusk found in the Red Sea. Very expensive. And uh, galbanum, an aromatic uh, raisin from uh, Asiatic plants or uh, frankincense, we know. It's a, a fragrant uh, gum raisin from uh, certain trees. So see, all these uh, are uh, special perfumes mixed uh, to get uh, the proper order, the smell, perfume, as they offer uh, to the Lord. And these are uh, priestly secret. Um, if you look at verse 10, uh, it speaks about uh, the day of atonement. The day of atonement. In fact, in the book of Leviticus, one entire chapter is dedicated to the day of atonement uh, with all the details of how uh, they should be celebrated, you know, the day of atonement. Here is just one one verse. Once a year, Aaron shall perform the rite of atonement on its horns. Throughout your generations, you shall perform the atonement for it once a year, the blood of the atoning sin offering. It is most holy to the Lord. So that is the most sacred uh, day of the year, the Yom Kippur, or the day of atonement, even today. So, technically speaking, everyone should fast on that day. It's a national day of mourning. And even the uh, ancient times, animals, the tourists, the foreigners, the strangers, they all are supposed to fast. No eating, complete uh, fast. And the details of uh, uh, the celebration is given in the uh, one entire chapter of uh, Leviticus and Leviticus. Time permits, we'll do that. So this verse 10, um, the high priest takes the life-saving smoke screen into the Holy of Holies and rubs the blood of the sacrificial animal 
on the horns of the altar of uh, incense itself. You know, um, if you read the book of uh, Leviticus, the Day of Atonement um, uh, speaks about the uh, um, the ox and the two goats. One goat is killed and sacrificed, and the blood is uh, poured on the altar and on the uh, people uh, for the atonement of the sins of the priest and the people as a whole. And then uh, another uh, uh, goat is uh, made the scapegoat. People extend their the goat is tied in the middle, and people extend their uh, hand. The priest puts both hands onto the uh, goat and accuse the goat of all the sins that he has committed and the people of Israel have committed. And finally, that goat is taken to the wilderness to wander around and be killed by the wild animals. That is called the scapegoat, the goat that takes the sins of um, the people. And it is the same um, sense the New Testament. Jesus is called the Lamb of God. Lamb of God who takes the sins of the world. The scapegoat of the Yom Kippur day is uh, Jesus in the New Testament. Okay. Um, in the, uh, verse 11, there's the temple tax. Temple tax. What is this tax? The tax is for the support of the sanctuary, um, for the upkeep of the sanctuary. Uh, in verse eleven and twelve, uh, you may look. Uh, it may uh, it might appear strange. The sense there's a census tax. What is the census tax? In the Old Testament, census is. Uh, uh, taken uh, sometimes considered as an offense to the Lord. The beginning of uh, Numbers chapter 1, a census is taken, it is purely for uh, military purpose to find out how many able bodied uh, uh, men, male, are available for a war. Uh, so they have to contribute one uh, half a shekel. They have to contribute half a shekel to the uh, upkeep of the temple. You know? So every adult male has to contribute half a shekel for the upkeep of the temple. So um, uh, fearing that God's wrath would be manifested against a census, we have the reference in chapter uh, 24 or 2 Samuel, uh, people paid a fee to avert God's wrath. Uh, that is the uh, fee that is paid is called the census uh, uh, fee of a shekel that is uh, paid. Okay, then this is basically um, chapter 30. Um, end of chapter 30, I already mentioned the, the formula of the incense. Okay. Um, uh, first, uh, chapter 31 uh, onwards, we will take um, uh, next uh, class, next week. So you will be um, told uh, at the end uh, in the next week when we will be having uh, the classes. Most probably it will be on a Friday and Saturday. We come back to Friday and Saturday because uh, uh, there won't be uh, the way of the cross via Kuchis on uh, uh, Friday. So we return to Friday and Saturday in the coming week. Okay, so I will um, um, stop for a moment. Uh, if you have questions, I will uh, take up uh, questions uh, for today. There are a few questions. From the last class, Exodus chapter 20, verse 5. Could you explain about the punishment up to fourth generation? Is it speaking of consequence of sin? 
it feels unfair and unjust for God to do such a thing. Yet this is extensively preached in many retreats. Yeah. I think uh, I, I will need uh, uh, some time to go into the issue of uh, uh, this. Let me just see. Um, I don't know if uh, everyone understood this. Um, see, there is um, a brother, what's that uh, reference once again? But there are two passages in uh, Exodus. One, I think, is chapter 20, correct? Chapter 20, verse 5 um, You shall not bow down, and so on. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents. To the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, there is a comma there. There is no full stop there. Comma. But showing steadfast love to the thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. For this, you have to read it with the other texts. Um, I will give the reference. Ezekiel chapter 18, 1 to 4. Ezekiel chapter 18, 1 to 4. And Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 29. Jeremiah chapter 20, 31, verse 21. Sorry, 20, 29. Uh, see, um, this issue came after uh, the exile the temple was destroyed and the people were taken into captivity to babylon and those in babylon were uh, questioning god god we uh, what um, oh, you want the repetition okay that is uh, uh, ezekiel chapter 18 1 to 4 Brother, can you just type for that? Ezekiel chapter 18, 1 to 4. Okay, I'll do that. Maybe I myself will uh, uh, type it here. Um, Ezekiel chapter 18, 1 to 4. And uh, Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 29. Um, basically, they were asking this question, and there was a, a problem. Okay, let's get back to uh, Jeremiah. It says, The parents have eaten sour grapes, and the children's teeth are set on edge. But all shall die for their own sins. So they were asking that question. Are we punished because of the sins of our parents? That is uh, uh, go to the uh, next uh, great prophet, the three greatest prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. Um, and Ezekiel 31. Is it that um, I would have a mistake? Oh, no, no, oh, sorry. Uh, Ezekiel 18. Yeah. Ezekiel 18. See, the word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used to buy you in Israel. I repeat, 
this proverb shall no more be used to buy you in israel no that all lives are mine the life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine it is only the person who sins that shall die so if the parents have sinned parents will have to pay for it if the children have sinned children should pay for it and a personal sin of the father may not i said may not or need not bring disaster on the children who have not done any prop any any sin there are some exceptions as we know for example uh i maybe i have my ancestral property that is meant for the upkeep of my children and my family and instead i waste that i use under this money for drinking or for gambling and i uh, lose all the property ancestral property which is sacred which is meant and i have to give to my descendants and instead i with my um, carelessness and my sins i lose that then my children my family will go bankrupt you know see i am responsible and they will have to the the influence of this is on them but otherwise uh, ezekiel and uh, jeremiah would say that proverb shall not be used in israel um, that because god does not wish the death of anyone because somebody has sinned you know uh, so what is to be understood when is your fourth generation ancient time a uh, full life a person sees to his children to the fourth generation that means one entire life fourth generation means uh, one entire life you know and but um, god's mercy is for thousand generation not for fourth generation thousand generation so god's mercy and faithfulness uh, is lasting okay i don't know if it's a, it is something that requires uh, long explanation but uh, i oh, oh, just want to quickly answer this question because it was also asked uh, posted earlier and i didn't want to enter it because it would take a long time but then it's coming repeatedly i just uh, answer this question 2 uh should we take question okay there's something else yeah there are few more yeah the the law of retaliation is re uh, revenge this is totally opposite when jesus speaks of forgiveness so is the law of retaliation purely of human origin and not coming from god himself i said uh, earlier the retaliation is uh, the natural instinct of uh, human beings and in order to restrict the extent of uh, retaliation um god put a limit and uh, in uh, matthew chapter 5 uh, we will hear jesus telling you know i have come uh, that uh, you have heard that was said but now i tell you so jesus goes beyond the old law and uh, he um, uh, he um, revises the old law of retaliation into forgiveness an unlimited forgiveness let's say um, if uh, someone strikes you on your right show the left also all that so he goes to the other extreme over uh, forgiveness yeah if the narratives found in the book of exodus regarding the ark of the covenant its curtains etc are later additions then the claim that god had instructed the israelites to do various things seem to be the ideas of moses or such leaders and they have been hiding behind god or rather shooting from god's shoulder thus these not take away the credibility of the word of god um see you were right at the beginning uh, we began the book of genesis uh, and exodus so there are different traditions um 
uh, what we have the written text that we have today is the result of uh, several centuries of uh, um, editing and redaction and uh, the oral tradition and, uh, the people transmitted their experience and they um, orally gave it and finally they wrote down in different places and then it was uh, put together so that is why there are different uh, strands of uh, thoughts you know different layers of uh, traditions um, and the same uh, event is narrated in different ways so we have the, the proof the multiplicity of uh, traditions are there so that does not mean that um, the word it is not god's word so the second vatican council says you know there are uh, double authors god as the author human being as the author the words God uh, did not write it down. So the author, the human author who uh, took up the inspiration from God, wrote down in the language, in the vocabulary that that person knew. So there's a double authorship. So it does not uh, lose the importance because it is written by a human author. But the origin, the source is God himself. So that way, Second Vatican Council, they were speaks of double authorship. God as the author, human being also as the author. I think it's almost time. Uh, we have passed uh, for six minutes past. So, other questions you could uh, post and uh, we'll see if we can uh, do it uh, uh, last week, uh, the next week's class. I uh, hope to wait up for uh, the coming week. But now we are uh, celebrating the greatest uh, event uh, tomorrow, what we call the Monday Thursday, the, man, the day that. Uh